practice medicine when you are uh, a long way from help and you don't have an MRI scanner and you don't have a team of nurses because they're the bosses and they really look after us as doctors, as junior doctors. So uh, you just don't have those with you. So I spent a lot of time kind of getting experience and going around the world. Uh, and that means that I have been privileged enough to, to, to go to a lot of places. So um, I don't know if uh, maybe Judy or Mike, uh, if I just chat at you, it could be quite boring. So if one of you guys unmutes uh, and I'm gonna, if, if anyone pops questions uh, or, or wants to ask questions or wants to say anything, if they could pop it in the chat and then one of you guys at any point can just interrupt me and, and ask me those questions kind of as we go. I'm uh, unmuted, yeah, Josh, and I'll ask some questions. And just to say, I'm sorry, with all the Zoom bombers, we've had five that we've kicked out now. Um, we are recording this talk. I hope that's all right with everybody. Um, but just to let you know, we're recording it. Yeah, over to you, Josh. Uh, so this is an iconic mountain. Most people that like expeditions and that like altitude will know this mountain. This is, does anyone know? You can pop it in the chat, let's see if I can. There's oh, always a delay, see. isn't there? Yeah, I can't see. I mean, it's obvious. It's Mount Everest. Oh. So this is. <laughs> <laughs> this is. This is one of the big ones, uh, and, and it, uh, there is something about mountains and uh, and about altitude as well. It's just some of the most beautiful places in the world, and I think. One thing about being outdoors, but specifically being in the mountains that really hits me every time I go is how small and insignificant. When you're stood next to this huge hump of rock, uh, you feel so insignificant. And, and at the same time, all your problems and all of your worries, you realize how insignificant they are as well. Uh, so that, that's one of the things that really kind of inspires me to go into the mountains. Um, but it can be, mountains can be dangerous places. Uh, as how do I? As every uh, expedition doctor knows, uh, there you have altitude sickness. So heading into the mountains, you can get pretty. Your body is not designed to be up there with no oxygen. Uh, so the doctor is always on call to make sure people feeling nauseous, people feeling lightheaded. Uh, people that just are really struggling to breathe. I, I remember the first time I went up to altitude, I was in Kilimanjaro in, um, in Africa, in Tanzania. And I remember, you know, I'd walked all the way. I thought I was young. I was in my 20s. I thought, oh, I'm strong. I can do this. It's easy. I remember getting up to one of the camps and I, I stood up from, from where my tent was and I went to, the, to go to the bathroom. And by the time I got there, I was kind of like leaning on the bathroom door, just puffing and puffing. I was just amazed at how it affects your body. Uh, on top of that, you've got all of these things on the left. On the left, this is a Serac. Now, I wish there was a person there in that, next to that Serac for scale, because that is a huge wall of ice. And there are times where you have to walk near, uh, underneath these things. You try and avoid going underneath them if you can, but sometimes it's unavoidable. Uh, and you've got to make sure that as much as you can, uh, you know that these things are not going to fall on you. And often that means that you're traveling at night. So place you'll travel. If you look at the photo on the right, this is uh, a, a, a mountaineer that's going up. I think this is Cotopaxi in the Andes in, um, in Ecuador, South America. But you're, you're moving all day, every day on glaciers. And glaciers are essentially frozen rivers. They are moving. Uh, and at night, they tend to move less because it's colder. And, and during the day, when the sun comes out, everything starts to melt and they start moving and shifting around. And that's when things open up. So if you look to the right of this uh, mountaineer, you've got a huge crevasse. And that, they just open up. Uh, I mean, it looks like they're going to swallow you up. It looks like they go to the center of the earth. They can be absolutely vast. Uh, and sometimes they can be covered in snow. So that helps. <laughs> that makes them a bit more treacherous. Uh, and this one's pretty easy to avoid because it's quite obvious. Other times they're not quite so obvious and you have to cross them either with little snow bridges or you have to go across them. Sometimes I'm sure you've seen the pictures of Everest where people are, have their crampons on their feet and they're kind of tiptoeing across these metal ladders to get across, across these huge uh, crevasses. And that really is quite scary. Um, what else did I want to tell you about mountains? So you, I don't know if you recognize this, this is the same mountain. This is a group that I took up to Everest Base Camp. 
which is one of the really easy to uh, easy accessible kind of mountains that you can go to in the world because um, it's very close to this amazing city called Kathmandu in Nepal. Uh, you you fly into a little airport and then it's a it's a walk essentially. You don't need any specialist equipment. You don't need any ice axes, crampons. You don't need harnesses. You don't need ropes. You just walk along and because the Nepalese. Uh, have basically colonized this whole area of the highlands, you know, way higher than any bit of the UK. Um, there are towns, very small remote towns and villages the whole way and the whole way along the route. So you can have a bed. You don't even need to stay in a tent from, from when you leave to when you get there, you can walk all the way to this. And if you look kind of to the left, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but where uh, there's a gentleman in the foreground on the left and his hands are pretty much on what is Everest Base Camp over there. Fairly sure that's where we're looking. And all of this area that you're looking at that looks kind of brown, uh, gray in the front is actually just ice. That's just a huge glacier, um, a huge river that's moving along and it's got a little covering of dust over the top. So these are some incredible places and, you know, it is achievable to go there. Uh, Other, this is the, uh, this, I think this is a mountain called Nevado Sahama down in South America as well, in the Andes, and this is us stopping to basically turn around, stop looking towards our goal, which is the summit of a, a huge mountain, and recoup, get our breath back, and have some lunch, and look over you know, just the beautiful scenery. And I think this kind of just shows what it's all about taking, even if you don't get to the top of these kind of mountains when you're looking at them. Um, it's just an incredible experience to have got this far, turn around, have a look at that and have that moment that is something you'll never forget. And photographs will never really kind of encompass everything that you're seeing and feeling in that moment. Um, this is another uh, formidable mountain I don't know, does anyone recognize this one? Any guesses? I'll, I'll tell you, this, this is Ben Nevis. This is one of our own. This, this looks, <laughs> it looks like it's, uh, it could be anywhere, right? It could be in the Andes, it could be uh, in the Himalayas, but no, we've got this. This is in Scotland. This is, uh, you know, uh, a, a car journey away uh, from an adventure that you could have any time of the year. Um, and I suppose what I wanted to say about this is that there are so many things to learn when you're in the mountains. You know, these guys, they're moving. They, you can see this guy on the right. He's got a helmet. He's got a harness. He's got all kinds of traditional trad climbing gear. He's got an ice axe, crampons, ropes, uh, and the same with these guys on the left. So there's a whole load of interesting things to learn when you go to these kind of places. Or you could just take it easy, go for an hour, or go for a walk. Um, Uh, and they, they, these are some other places that I've been. The one on the left, bottom left, is um, it's actually in Mexico. You wouldn't think that there were glaciers and mountains like that in Mexico, but this is a, a volcano. Uh, but what I really wanted to highlight with this is all the people that you meet along the way on these journeys. So these uh, sometimes groups of people that know each other before they go. Sometimes they're people just that didn't had never met uh, and form kind of lifelong friendships, lifelong bonds. There are people from all over the world. At the top left, we've got, this is um, an expedition to, uh, this one is Ruka Pachincha, I think, in, in Ecuador. Um, but there were people on this trip from, there were Nepalese, there were English people, there were people from China, there were two Indian people, there were people from Tan Tasmania in uh, kind of south of, Australia, um, there were people from uh, Hong Kong, all these people kind of coming together from all different walks of life. Uh, uh, and really, when you're in this kind of place, doesn't matter who you're with, you are really relying on teamwork. You're in places that are very remote uh, and you're relying on all, all of those people in your team uh, to pull their weight, uh, to help you and, and you help them. Uh, and you really do kind of form bonds and get really close in ways that you don't when you're, you know, I, I've been closer with people that I spent two weeks walking a long mountain trial with, trail with uh, than people that I've worked in hospital with for years or worked in, in your workplace with for years. So 
Uh, and not all of the friends that you meet on mountains have two legs. This is a gentleman in the, the picture on the right who has four, who I thought was incredible because uh, if you can see, he's this is on Mount Elbrus in, on the border of Georgia and Russia. Uh, and on a mountain, uh, it doesn't look very sunny there, but often you can get snow blindness because you are so close to the sun and it's reflecting off the snow. Uh, so you literally get sunburnt on your eyeballs, which doesn't sound very nice, which is why he's wearing a little visor. And he's got some, uh, he's actually lost one of his gloves on his, on his feet to keep him nice and warm. Moving um, on. Josh, before you leave the mountains, I was really yeah. surprised a couple of uh, weekends ago. I had a lady from Pakistan and uh, she was virtually in tears because uh, there'd just been the news about the first team to actually get to the top of K2, I think it was, mm -hmm. on, in, in the, the winter. winter, on a very difficult route. And um, they got to the top, the guys, but then, and they were Pakistani team, uh, but they, they died on the way down. And this was such sorrow for the people of Pakistan who had been, I mean, it's a bit like Tenzing, you know, and Hillary getting to the top of Everest. Uh, in 1952 was it you know that the, the whole nation was celebrating and for the Pakistani community to then experience this celebration of their own team getting up the mountain for the first time and then coming to grief on the way down was was it just it just hit everybody and so I think there's that sort of thing about the mountains as well um, the danger that people put themselves in uh, to get to the top of these huge mountains. Absolutely, yeah, and it's, it is a tragedy. Um, but at the same time, it's something to celebrate. These people are athletes, the, the kind of people that are doing K2 in the winter. I mean, I don't know if anyone watches the, um, there's a, a kind of celebrity um, charity event where they televise, the BBC televise uh, some celebrities that climb Kilimanjaro uh, yeah. every uh, every Christmas, I think it is. Um, and some of those are, you know, uh, triathletes and, and they don't get to the top of Kilimanjaro, which is 6,000 meters. Uh, K2 is, is over 8,000 meters. Every step that you're going above that is like running a marathon. It's an incredible feat and it is incredibly dangerous. Um, I mean, one of my favorite bits of every expedition uh, is that on the first night when we get into country, I get the pleasure of giving the kind of team talk and I'm basically scared the Jesus out of everyone <laughs> by telling them how how dangerous what they're about to do is um, and how you know to take not to take it like lightly to take it seriously um, and yeah absolutely it's a very dangerous thing to do but I would say that the benefits are well, depending on everyone has their limit I have my limit of you know <laughs> what's too dangerous um, but uh, the the benefits of doing it far outweigh the risks in those uh, situations. I'm sure that every one of those um, Pakistani team would have said the same. They took the risk uh, and they did an ama amazing thing. So, uh, so moving into uh, deserts. Deserts I spent a lot less time than mountains simply because there are less reasons people going, uh, wanting to do research or wanting to go um, on, on expeditions or to do charity runs or charity work in the desert, but they are beautiful places. They are, there's a whole different kind of um, travel when you get there, you are completely uh, reliant on your vehicle. Basically everything is a vehicle bound expedition these days. Uh, I've never been privileged enough to, you know, be on camelback moving through the desert, but um, we have been very, very remote places and you pretty much have to pack everything with you that includes your water your tents your food for the whole duration uh, and if your vehicle goes um, goes down or breaks you have to be able to fix it else you need a second vehicle else you're stuck <laughs> so they're uh, very similar in some ways to to mountains in that you, you you're not going to find food you're not going to find water actually you can find water on those mountains with all the snow but um, very li little um, vegetation or life but you, you've got the opposite extreme of temperature. They are incredibly hot um, and uh, difficult places to survive, I suppose. So where's um, this then, Josh? Where's this well, desert? So, so these, this is two deserts. Uh, the one on the left, I think, is actually Death Valley. And the one on the right uh, is, is the Atacama Desert in Chile in South, Southern America. Um, but actually, uh, there are 
all kinds of deserts in the world. Uh, and this one on the right, obviously, we're still on the road, um, but it's when you turn off the road and you're a few days off of the road that it starts to get scary. Uh, and this is what we are really, when, when I've been to the desert, this is what we're really aiming for. These are the people that live there uh, and they really know how to do it properly. They don't need <laughs> a vehicle full of all of their, um, their gear and their food and their fuel. And they, these people can find water anywhere. Um, they can navigate on their own, they can find food, uh, they can make their own fire without any of the mod, mod cons that, that we have. Um, so uh, this is the kind of proper survival skills and, and desert travel that uh, I think has been lost and is getting more and more lost uh, and trying to strike a balance. Often it's, it's this kind of tourism when you're, um, you're going to wild places, but you don't want to destroy it. At the same time, you want to kind of um, learn these kind of skills and carry them forward. And, and I don't know, I don't have all the answers of how that looks in the modern world. Um, but certainly, uh, you know, acknowledging that these people have lessons to teach us uh, that, that I certainly um, value and I don't know. Okay. Uh, jungles. <laughs> Now, jungles are a place that I am far more at home. I, I often feel a bit out of my comfort zone in a desert, but in the jungle, this is a stark contrast to a mountain uh, or a desert in that the jungle gives you everything that you could possibly need to survive and everything that you could uh, possibly need to kill yourself at the same time. It's an amazing place. Uh, you know, mountains, apart from the occasional... Um, avalanche that you might hear at night they're very quiet places deserts can be very quiet the jungle is full of life it's full of noise uh, it's a, a constant battle with the ants it's hot it's humid uh, but it's amazing all the same um, you in a, a different way to, to deserts and to, to mountains you know if you go back to this picture of the mountain yeah the first one from where these guys are standing to the, that peak over there that they can see, that might take them a week, that might take them two weeks to travel to that place. It is amazing at the scale of these things and the distances you can see. By the time you get into a jungle, you can't see 10 feet in front of you. So as soon as you've gone into a jungle, um, you might be you know, an hour's walk or, or three days trek into a jungle. It's it's all the same. You are completely surrounded by a wall of trees. You don't know, you know, you, there might be a, a road near you. you. You wouldn't be able to tell. You can find solitude in 10 minutes of walking rather than 10 days. It's an incredible place. Um, we, just, we just had a comment from Neil who says that we can learn so much from the indigenous peoples of the world and that they live the ultimate sustainable life. And that's from somebody who is a farmer in the Yorkshire Dales. He's now chair of the National Park Authority and is trying to encourage other farmers to have sustainable forms of farming. So thanks, Neil. Uh, any reflections on that, Josh? Sorry, I've thrown you there. Yeah, no, no. Well, so that it, it is one of these things that uh, I'm constantly battling with, which is the, the, um, the balance between sustainability and travel, because I'm obviously, you know, getting on planes <laughs> and traveling long distances into um, parts of the world uh, that, that are very special. And the way that I look at it is if I didn't, if I'd never done that, if I'd never kind of been these places and learned, I, if I'd never see, uh, you know, met the indigenous population in, in Namibia, if I've never, um, you know, met, uh, made friends in uh, uh, the Nepalese highlands, I wouldn't know those things were there and I, they wouldn't be important to me and I wouldn't know that they needed to be sustained. So there's, there's that part of it. And then there's the, oh, but I don't want anyone else to go. <laughs> it's a really difficult balance. Um, so as much as we can, you know, as much as you can, um, I think, you know, learning these lessons from, from people, but, uh, you know, we practice the thing. I think Josh's uh, internet's been a little bit unstable at the moment. Um, he said that at the beginning of the talk, we were not being able to hear him very well. So we'll just give him, we've got one of those evenings no tonight. Whenever we go to a place, we try and make sure that we leave. 
Oh, hello. What was that? Hi. You you keep coming in and going. So I think your internet. Oh no. Just hearing you coming back. Oh. Don't worry. Don't worry. We've got there. We're, we're back with right. you. Uh, there was, okay. I know you were in, in that sustainability thing and I know exactly how you feel because I think, you know, quite a lot of us here today have probably been in that same boat. You know, we want to live a sustainable life, but we also, you know, want to be able to travel because travel broadens the mind, especially the young people here who haven't yet had the opportunities that some of the old bogeys here have actually had. So that's that's a big issue I think that's burning in these days of climate change and for me that's something I feel really sad that uh, for the youngsters there is that dilemma that I suppose I never faced in my young days. Josh? Yeah, yeah I agree I agree there is a dilemma it's always there um, but it's not going to stop that's the other thing I think people aren't going to stop traveling and uh, and and they're not all going to do it the right way. <laughs> So um, I think, uh, you know, what's the lesser of two evils? Uh, but then again, I don't have all the answers and I wouldn't pretend to. No. We have got a question from, is it Jacobian? Do you want to unmute yourself? Is it Jacob or take yourself off mute? Can't hear you. Have you, you might have automatically oh, have I muted, muted everyone. All right, because of the, okay, the because of that. People. All right, so I'll just say what he said. He just wanted to ask a question about Nims Dye, who uh, recently summited K2 in the winter. Hello, uh, I, I think you might be able to hear me now. Yes, we can. Nims, yes. Yes. Sorry, I, I just want, I don't mean to interrupt you. I just wanted to ask a question about Nims Dye, who's, who is a Gurkha, sol, uh, a Gurkha in the army. And he's recently summited K2 in the winter, which, which was a first um in terms of a challenge and I, I was just wondering in terms of like his support crew would he have been likely to have like a big group of doctors and physios for instance or is it is it likely to just be sort of one one person like yourself that that's in charge of in charge of the group's uh, health for instance uh in, in charge of their health so he will probably have one doctor for his crew so i imagine there's probably a crew of less than 30 people but he's got i mean there's obviously a huge budget there he didn't just cite some one yeah. mountain he did all all um all 14 of the eight thousanders within was it just over six months or something silly? yeah and Absolutely i think the, the previous the previous record was something like eight years so it's quite Absolutely. unprecedented yeah and um, he i mean he obviously he was flying from helicopter uh, with helicopter from from uh, base mm -hmm. camp to base camp uh, he had a huge team and a huge budget and absolutely he will have had a medical team with him um i don't know actually how how yeah. he did it but i'm sure he will have had uh, an expedition medic at each base camp so whether it was the same one that carried okay. uh, went along with him um or whether he had one or two or three different ones for different yeah i, I was just sort of mountains. wondering about the scale of sort of the operation i wanted to know what sort of size uh the, the support team really was um, yeah i don't know i don't know yeah. but, but definitely not one person is the answer to that so okay. yeah um <laughs> I, I imagine thank you, his thank team you so much. around in, t in terms of all of the logistics and everything was probably around 30 people including his um or mm. more Mm, about that at least that <laughs> yeah including well, brilliant. His, uh, thank, you. thank you so much for that thank you so you were telling us about the jungle as well josh so where's this photo yeah give us a bit of background so this is Stuart. this is one of our expedition leaders in borneo doing what Stuart does most of the time sleeping uh but you can see that we have this is kind of how a jungle expedition uh runs we we generally walk uh, from waterfall camp to waterfall camp and those are amazing places it's really hard to take a picture um, because there are so many trees but we generally sleep in this is actually um, a pole bed but usually hammock and tarp um, all of this is treated with permethrin so that uh, all of the creepy crawlies that are trying to attack us um, don't attack us too much during the night uh, and as you can see there are this, there are um, bug nets everywhere. We, when we take our clothes off, they go into a, a, a bug net so that nothing can, like scorpions and, and, um, and centipedes can crawl into them whilst we're sleeping and then we put them on our bodies. Um, uh, and, you know, it's one of those places that it can really make or break you. You, you either love it uh, and you love the, you know, difficulty that it is uh, moving around in the jungle 
um, or, or you hate it. Some people just fall apart in the jungle uh, uh, and it's every trip. And um, I'm not going to say it's a joy to see, uh, but it's, it's quite interesting how it really kind of plays on people's um, psychology uh, to stay strong uh, and, and to kind of rely on your team and work as a team. And, and I, I love the jungle. This is um, kind of what a jungle camp looks like. And this is actually the site of where one of uh, our team decided to walk straight through uh, the middle. Instead of walking the cleared area, they walked straight through the middle of all of these um, bits of uh, loose leaves on the floor uh, and got bitten by a snake. A good, good day's walk from the nearest uh, river. So that was, that was a bit of fun. And these are some of the things that you can expect to see. Um, the one in the middle, this is Stuart again, and we'd, uh, this is where we had all kind of rocked up to this beautiful waterfall, which you can't see is on Stuart's right, and we had thrown all of our packs down on this rock that he's standing on, and there's a log right there, and some of us sat on the log, and then we all went for a swim in the lake, in, in, the, in the kind of pond at the bottom of the waterfall, and then we got out, and as we got out, someone picked up their bag and, and threw it down, and when they threw it down, they disturbed this little uh, snake who was sat right underneath the log that we were all on about 10 minutes prior. Um, so we kind of moved him out of the way. Uh, the top right is a, a fellow that we found in our, our kitchen on a desert island expedition. Um, the bottom left is sometimes there is no way around the waterfall and the only way is to sail down. Um, the, the one on the top left is, is actually, um, uh, it's actually a simulation but of uh, getting uh, people that you can get uh, really dehydrated uh, and you can get heat stroke and heat sickness in the in the jungle um, and this is us putting some fluids into him and the bottom right is just how everyone's feet look after you know five days of walking through rivers uh, and uh, ravines to get around uh, and it can be quite challenging but well worth it because uh, when you get to that kind of point where you're so good or good enough but you know, so good, so drilled, you've got all of your routine perfectly down and you become comfortable in the jungle. You get this kind of moment of zen where you almost feel like Tarzan, but not quite. <laughs> uh, and it is a really awesome feeling. And the jungle is one of those places that, you know, I could spend long, long periods of time. After, you know, three weeks on a mountain or three weeks in the desert without having a shower, you know, you need to get out. But the jungle uh, is, a, you know, you can have a, a shower under the waterfall. Uh, it's an incredible place. Um, there aren't too many of those in the UK, so they're not so easy to get to, not so accessible. Um, but I would say there are, you know, any any bit of the tropics uh, uh, places that you can head into the jungle, and places that not many people go. Actually, it's not a well frequented kind of expedition. So where was that jungle? Uh, various different it? ones. So this one is Borneo. So this is actually in Brunei, in Borneo. Brunei, the, the famous oil kind of capital of um, a bit of the world, but uh, they're awesome because they, they don't need to exploit or cut down their jungles for uh, palm oil or any other reason because they get their money from the petroleum. So their jungles are incredible, uh, primary forest with you know, ancient trees, uh, really beautiful. And there's a moment on this expedition actually where we come up to the border with Malaysia from Brunei um, and we do it every year. There's an HLS helicopter landing site, which is kind of a clearing that's cut. And we make sure we bring everyone up to there because there is a line on the border with Malaysia. And we did it one year and the bulldozers were literally in the fields in Malaysia. And the whole you know, expanse of everything that you've, you've been used to not being able to see more than 10 yards in front of you. And all of a sudden it opens up, you can see the horizon and it's just plantation and plantation after plantation, um, as far as you can see. So that one, that's there. This is in Malaysia rather than in um, the Malaysian side of Borneo. And some of these are in um, Langkawi and on mainland Malaysia as well. So that's where most of the jungles are that I've been to. Um, we just got put in the chat, Shelley. I don't know who Shelley is, but Shelley seems to know an awful lot. She's just replied to Jacob about NIMS and there's quite an interesting uh, conversation there going on about doctors and medical tents and little hospitals um, on expeditions so that's quite interesting thanks Shelley for putting that in 
Josh, we've got nice... Oh, uh, I, I can't see that at the moment, but I'll have a read of it yeah, and yeah. work it out. This looks like a polar scene, is it? Yes, it is. How much time have I spent? I'm going to try and work out. I don't want to take too long. 33 minutes. Okay, I'll be quick. No, <laughs> I'll finish fine. up. So, uh, yeah, so polar. Polar environments are technically a desert because what they, they classify as a desert. There is very little uh, liquid precipitation. Uh, they are punishing but incredible places if you like deserts. Uh, you feel really isolated really quickly when you go into a, a kind of a polar lands landscape and again you're relying on your team. Uh, we travel, uh, this is how we travel half of the time um, in snowmobile but also snowshoes, um, skiing, carrying your sled or colt sled or if you're really lucky and you've got a whole team of huskies um, and we're lucky enough uh, uh, one of the people I work with has a husky uh, yard out in Nor right in the north of Norway, way in the, the Arctic Circle. So we can take these guys out and they are great fun. Um, uh, and that's kind of how we, we travel around. Again, you need to carry all of your things with you because uh, although there are indigenous people that, that can fend for themselves and find food in this kind of environment, it's incredibly difficult. And even shelter is difficult so we carry broadsided tents which have uh, and a, a big stove so at the end of the day we can put these tents up light the stove uh, put a little uh, heat sink in the in the snow and they get nice and warm and it's a bit of luxury um, but there are other ways uh, of, I'm sure you've seen the igloos this is uh, uh, someone digging a snow cave or a, a snow hole um, and you can that's a good way to keep yourself warm and, and uh, out of the elements and we practice all of these things in terms of survival uh, and you might uh, recognize this and this is the la one of my last slides and this I just wanted to say that you didn't have to go miles and miles to find a kind of position that's find an adventure adventure is free this is the Yorkshire Dales uh, and I'm very jealous Judy that you get to live there because I looked up some pictures and it looks amazing uh, it looks a lot like Sussex might maybe better um, uh, and it's a beautiful place. Uh, so I just wanted to finish by just saying, so, so why do I do it? Why do I spend so much time outdoors? Why do I like to leave the urban areas, spend so much time out of cities and in the countryside? Uh, and the answer is because I love it, it's because it is, it is freedom. Um, it helps me de-stress. I think the longer I spend away from the city, the, or when I'm in the city, I feel I get more and more kind of more pressure builds up that you don't even realize is building up and it, it takes getting away to these kind of places to like to really let it all go reset relax uh, and there's something about the exercise as well you know when you're walking around these places i'm sure it's something to do with the endorphins um, but it kind of really resets and if i don't get out uh, into the countryside at least every few weeks then i get a bit crazy anyway i strongly encourage anyone that's on this uh the zoom to go explore um and to get involved with uh, people in the dales thank you very much oh thank you <laughs> that's very kind of you to promote us there at the end um i think i was a bit stressed myself with all the zoom bombers at the beginning so can you just tell us a little bit more how how you got into it because i know you lived in the countryside but then you became a doctor. So what, what were the steps? What did I miss? Sorry, I, I kind of missed uh, those bits. Can you just say uh, that for anybody else who might have missed it? Yeah, into expedition medicine specifically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and the other question that's kind of related to that for me is, you're a doctor, you work in A&E. How do you get out of the hospital? How do you get out of being a doctor to go on expeditions? You know, how does it work? Uh, so how did I get into it? Uh, obviously, so I think, First of all, I, I had to develop a love for the countryside, uh, and and that was just from from young age, just being growing up in the countryside, and basically being poor, <laughs> and that meant that we are, all of our holidays were in a campsite somewhere, you know, in a tent somewhere, um, because we couldn't afford to be in the hotels, and that was awesome because that was much better than going to some fancy hotel with a swimming pool. Uh, it, it kind of, um, it, yeah, it. it it gives you that passion for the outdoors. Uh, and as soon as I was in the same kind of situation that Becca is in now, which is you get your medical degree or you're on the way to get your medical degree and you realize that, um, that I don't want to sit indoors that whole time. I need to find some way to mix the two. Uh, so there are, there's loads of experiences that you can go on. Um, 
in terms of the expedition skills. So, you know, if you want to climb a mountain with a team of people, you need to be pretty good at climbing that mountain so that you can look after them. So I would join all of the societies at the University of the Mountaineering Society, the Climbing Society, um, et cetera, et cetera, and get away when it was uh, subsidized <laughs> and cheap uh, and just We're just uh, losing him again. The first one I went on was, uh, you know, uh, there were clients, you know, their their people's um, uh, expedition company that had clients that one oh, says my internet connection is unstable. We're with you. We lost you for yeah. a moment, but we got you back. Uh, and they're willing to let you go along. And it's like anything in life the first time you do it you get a bit of imposter syndrome you think oh, am i qualified to do this am i okay to do this and then after a, a long time of doing it it becomes normal and it becomes your job mm -hmm. uh i've forgotten the second question what was it, it how was do about... you how do you manage it now that you're in a and e hmm. yeah so i'm very fortunate all of my um work essentially is freelance so whether it's for the a and e department or whether it's for the expedition companies uh, if you are on a contract, I suppose a, a permanent contract, nine to five, you get your twenty something days leave a year, and that doesn't really um, that doesn't really work when you're spending someone you know, calling you up and saying, saying, "Can you spend three months in South America?" You, you just can't, and that's the industry is, which is why the, the you know, travel tourism. Um, anything that's to do with travel, whether it's, um, you, there's no jobs because of it. Um, uh, and the same. It's such a shame. We just keep losing you, Josh, at that moment. I'm really sorry. I think, I yeah. hope it's not my... Got that. Hey, let me let me just read out another question. Can you hear us? Hopefully. Uh, so I think another interesting question came about uh, how will COVID change expedition travel? Um, I think this is really interesting. If you can see it in the chat, that the Everest season is from May um, onwards and it's already open and they're expecting 60 percent of the usual traffic on the mountain. But the question is, you know, will it return to normal or is this year kind of hindered by COVID this year and will we not get back to normal this year? I don't know if Josh managed to hear us there. Oh dear. So it looks like we've uh, we've lost Josh for a time. He's uh, got kicked out, he's reconnecting. So uh, Mike, you might need to allow him back in because we've, uh, we've closed the meeting. <laughs> for any Zoom bombers, so we'll have to get around that. But in the meantime, can I just tell you that uh, the, the last talk in this series of talks is going to be next Tuesday. And the talk is uh, going to be called Pad Our Story. It's going to be all about the work that we do, uh, People in the Dales, and I'm so excited I've put all the information in the chat, so if you want it, uh, you should be able to find it any moment. I'm really excited because um, five members of our community, five people who've come out with us, uh, two people from refugee backgrounds and three people from South Asian backgrounds are all going to come and join us next Tuesday and talk a little bit about um, the, their involvement in the project People in the Dales getting diverse groups of people out and about they're going to come and talk to us about you know their involvement what they've done and in particular how it's impacted on them um, I had an email last week from somebody who I hadn't been in touch with for a, a long long time uh, he'd seen a photograph on Facebook of a time that he was staying in a cottage in the Yorkshire Dales that people in the Dales had helped and uh, he was just reminded so much of what had happened in that period. And he said to me, he said, I felt a broken person when I came. I felt like I, um, you know, I, I was worthless. I was close to suicide. 
Uh, but subsequent to that, um, you you had us in this place for a weekend, you looked after us, you, you made us feel welcome and my life has changed since then. I'm now in a secure job, I now have married, I have children and I just look back at that story and think that was a turning point. And so, you know, it's inspirational how getting people out in the dales, out in the countryside can change and transform lives. Uh, so Josh, I was just filling in there uh, while we lost you and uh, telling people about next week's talk. But uh, are you back with us, Josh, or have we lost the internet connection again? No, we'll give him one more minute, see if we can get him back. I think we've we've uh, we've struggled with that. Yeah. Oh, Josh, are you with us? I can see your head moving, but can't hear you. Hey, I'm there sort you of back. Go. I think I'm, I, I'm cutting in and out. There you go. Yeah, so you just told us that um, <clears throat> uh, that uh, hospitals, because you're freelance, you're able to do a bit of both. So that's the way it works. But I suppose if you were full time in A and E, it would be very difficult to do expeditions. Uh, if you spent every moment of your holidays, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Josh, any final very, comments? Very any final comments before? No, I don't think I've got anything else to say. I just thank you for letting me be part of this, and uh, you know, encouraging people to access the countryside as much as possible. Good. 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 Well, thank you very much, Josh. I mean, it's been an absolute pleasure to have us. I'm sorry about all the technical problems. I apologise profusely. We uh, we will learn how to uh, avoid Zoom bombers from now on, but it's been an experience. You know, we have to have one of those once in a blue moon. Eileen, did you have a question? Yes, please. I, I want to ask Josh, were mm -hmm. you always um, really, really needed? Have you had serious things happen or...? Uh, minor things yeah i've had quite a lot of serious things a lot of things uh, especially at altitudes so people are not meant to go up to those kind of altitudes they're not supposed to survive up there so there's a lot of what we call hape and haste high altitude pulmonary edema and high altitude cerebral edema and those things will kill you if you don't treat them and the treatment is often uh, descending uh, and if you can't descend then a whole load of medications and then descend as quickly as you can so We've had some pretty serious things uh, such as that. Always a worry is, um, is the anaphylaxis, so the uh, you know, severe allergic reactions in, uh, in the jungles, uh, and also a whole load of um, primates. And by that, I mean the people swinging parangs and, uh, and uh, what do you call that parang? You call it machete. Uh, swinging a machete around uh, in the jungle is... Uh, uh, <laughs> A recipe for um, uh, cuts and scrapes. Uh, thankfully, I've not seen a finger go missing yet, but <laughs> um, that's why we're there, I suppose. Thank you. Uh, Andrew, Andrew Campbell, you've got a question. Hello, Judy. Yes, I mean, I'm fascinated. Uh, what a job. Gosh, um, envious if I was 50 years younger um, and rather fitter. Uh, I can't think of a... a, a a better way of spending my time but my god there's a lot of responsibility on your shoulders isn't there when you when you take on uh, the medical officer in an expedition you you must feel you've got to got to be every sort of doctor rolled into one Yeah, and I, I would I would probably imagine that the mental health doctor is as val as important as the uh, physical doctor yeah. on an expedition. Yeah. yeah. Josh, what are the questions? Are you with us? Yeah, a, okay, a little what... bit, but I mean, I think, can you, can you, hello? Am I... Yeah, yeah, we can hear hello? you. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, yeah, I think that's a lot of emergency medicine. You know, every doctor rolled into one, that's... Uh, you know that's what we see every day and there's a lot of responsibility there in the emergency department and that kind of extends um to to you know, 
of the fields, but you've got a, you do have some way of contacting someone that can help you. Uh, really good evacuation plans, medevac plans, um, uh, and usually a sat phone uh, uh, at the ready. So um, I find it lots and lots of fun, regardless of the responsibility. <laughs> Josh, one of the questions that you missed was about the COVID that, you know, especially Everest, the season is May, it's almost already open and, you know, they're expecting the usual traffic or are they? What's going to happen in the COVID in the expedition world? No. We've lost him again. Hello. Hi. I'm really sorry. I don't know what's wrong with do you want to take... It is my internet that keeps cutting out. Yeah. So... Josh, are you in a hospital? Is that what it is? It's um, hospital internet that's uh, letting you down. <laughs> <laughs> no, that would be more reliable. No, I'm in my own home. I'm very sorry. It's, okay. it's London. Okay, don't worry. Uh, did you get that question? COVID, how's that going to affect expeditions? Oh, uh in a huge way, and it already has, obviously, you know about the restrictions um, for travel, the restrictions to just to return. Um, I do feel, uh, and this is, you know, um, this is just my opinion, it's not, not um, we just don't know what's going to happen, is the truth of the matter. We're gonna to have to see what happens, but uh, I do feel like um, it will, re there, there will be a return to normal at some point. Most diseases, every pandemic that's ever existed has burnt itself out in some way. We've got the added advantage of having uh, yeah, um, incredible I get the feeling I could almost say that what he's saying is that we've got incredible vaccinations uh, that have helped us on the road so I think that's it yeah, yeah. so there you go yeah okay um I love you saying, Josh, that you either love it or hate it. I would love the mountains, but I'm not sure about the jungle. I've uh, <laughs> lived in Fiji and Papua New Guinea, and I'm afraid the snakes. When you talk about snakes, that's absolutely a no-no for me. So I'm not sure I'm a, um, I'm not sure I'm a, a jungle person, but a mountain person. But Josh, um, thank you so much for turning up. You know, giving up your time. Thank you for coming and talking to us and sharing some great photos. Thank you for a few stories. And uh, I think when the internet's working properly and we haven't got Zoom bombers, I think we need to get you back and get some gory details about uh, medicine in expeditions because I think you've got some great slides to do with that. Anyway, Lovely. guys, are you back with us, Josh? No, I think we've lost. Anyway, yeah, thank, I thank you. Thank you very much, Judy. <laughs> Yeah, I'll oh, thank you. And we're having lots of thanks and lots of congratulations and cracks. Anyway, good night, everybody. And thank you very much for turning up and uh, see you for a pad talk next next week. But thank you all very much. Good night. Next week.